The Earth is a water planet, but global water resources are under attack. From dead zones to acidic oceans and rising seas to vanishing aquifers, our water planet is changing in ways that threaten us all. The good news is solutions exist, and Earth Echo is on a mission to find them. I'm Philippe Cousteau. Join me as we explore the effects of acidifying oceans on Earth Echo Expedition's Shell Shock. Our Earth Echo Expedition team has arrived in Seattle, Washington to explore ocean acidification, a problem that, like climate change, threatens our entire planet. The waters in Puget Sound offer scientists a glimpse of how minor changes in chemistry can have a tremendous impact on the health of our oceans. I'm meeting with Laura Spencer, a shellfish biologist, to get a look at the creature that first brought attention to the issue of ocean acidification right here in Puget Sound. Laura, shellfish are, are, have become somewhat of the poster child for ocean acidification and the negative impacts that it can have on natural ocean ecosystems. There was a crisis about a decade ago or so here with the oyster population that really made people wake up to ocean acidification. Can you tell me a little about that? Yeah, in about uh, 2007 or 2008, um, there was a major die-off of the oyster populations in um, the various shellfish um, hatcheries. And a lot of shellfish companies didn't have a lot of product. The ocean may be acidifying, especially here in Puget Sound. Um, and that might be cause for concern. I'm with the Puget Sound Restoration Fund, and we are here at our hatchery um, in Manchester, Washington, and we're actually growing the native oyster called the Olympia oyster. We're basically augmenting the populations. So the humble oyster right. <laughs> does an incredible amount of benefit for ecosystems, and of course, you know, a lot of people love to eat them, so they have an economic value as well. In the Puget Sound area, they are about a $100 million industry a year. So this is a very significant industry, and you're doing something about it, and we get an opportunity to see a little bit behind the scenes yep. of what you're doing, yep. growing let's, oysters. Let's go check it out. We have some oysters um, in our hatchery right now. I'm very excited. All right, come on. So this is where the magic happens. Yep, you got this it. Is, this is very cool. Now, most people, Laura, most people, when they think of oysters, they think of the big oysters that we see you know, in storefronts mm -hmm. or in restaurants, mm -hmm. but something else is in here. Yes, these are baby oysters. Well, this is very cool because most people actually never get to see what a baby oyster looks like and understand the life cycle of an oyster. So these are living oysters. They are. And these are actually the oyster species that are native to the Pacific coast. The one interesting thing about the Olympia oyster is that they brood their larvae. So most other species release, the male release sperm and the female release egg, and that meets in the water column and uh, fertilizes and then grows. The Olympia oyster actually, um, the female filters in sperm into her mantle cavity and fertilizes the egg inside and then broods that larvae for a, you know, a short time before releasing it into the water. Huh. So that actually makes the Olympia oyster less vulnerable to shifting uh, ocean conditions like ocean acidification. So when so, they're born, they're the size of a pepper yep. flake or smaller. Yep. And then within a few months, they're about this size. Mm -hmm. And then what's next? Well, we have some full-size oysters here. These are full-size Olympia oysters. And that's the part of the work we're doing. We actually enhance beaches by adding oyster shell, just plain oyster shell out onto the beach to promote these natural sets. You know, it reminds us the interconnectivity of nature and these ecosystems and these animals within these ecosystems mm -hmm. that you know, oysters, it's not just about the food that they may provide directly to animals, but the habitat that they provide and right. the, the impacts that has on fisheries like salmon and others because baby fish need a place to hide and, mm -hmm. and, and this whole cascading impact on the ecosystem when you remove one species can be really, really significant. While shellfish like oysters are of huge economic importance, scientists are beginning to see evidence that the impacts of ocean acidification are not limited to those animals that build shells. The team at NOAA's Northwest Fisheries Science Center are taking on the daunting task of connecting the dots between filter feeders and scavengers, and from prey to predators. 
by modeling ecosystems, they can predict how the effects of OA on one species may start a ripple effect that no ocean dweller can escape. I joined research ecologist Paul McElhaney to find out how they make these connections. What we do is we rear animals in water where we're controlling the amount of CO2 that's in the water. We do that with these units right here that we refer to as our ocean time machine. We collect animals from Puget Sound that we're interested in studying um, and looking at how they're going to respond uh, in a higher CO2 environment. And so we uh, have water that has the sort of same conditions out in the Puget Sound. This one right here is oh, okay. operating right now. Um, so we can control the amount of CO2 that we put in the water so mm -hmm. it uh, has the, the conditions that we might see now. And so then you have all these individual jars. Right, and in okay. these jars are where we grow the animals that we're Got studying. It. Got it. Got so it. obviously we're doing relatively small animals because we're focusing on the larval stages because we, um, those are generally the most susceptible stages. It's not the, the big adults uh, because the big adults are a little more resilient. On this poster over here, we have what these look like. As I said, to really kind of see them in that sort of detail, you need to look at them under the microscope. Um, but these are what the larval crab look like. Uh, but the larval stages are planktonic. That means that they live out in the water column. It's part of the, the plankton, the food in the water column, they become food for fish and salmon um, and other species uh, mm -hmm. that are in Puget Sound. So in some places, uh, these Dungeness crab larvae can be the primary source of food. The resident orca whales here in Puget Sound, their primary food source is salmon. And that so. is an endangered population right. of orcas, the resident right. orcas here in, in Puget Sound. And, and they primarily, unlike transient or migratory orcas, they primarily feed on salmon. And those salmon are feeding on these zooplankton. And right. so fundamentally there's a direct link you know, a lot of people don't know what a crab larvae looks like, but a lot of everybody knows what an orca looks like. Impact of ocean acidification all the way up to the food chain to things like orca that you might not think would be impacted right. by ocean acidification. Right, these, yeah, it kind of goes from these tiny little things that you can barely see yes. up to, you know, something that it's hard to miss. Well, Paul, thank you, man, for, for yeah. all the work that you're doing. This is really terrific and, uh, and, and fascinating. And uh, we'll, we'll continue to work with you and monitor this information and share it with with all of our uh, uh, all of our students and participants at Earth Echo Expedition, and um, and keep learning everything that we can about this this very real crisis that we're facing. I appreciate Great. it. Great. Thanks. Thanks a lot. To learn more about ocean acidification and find ways to take action in your own community, visit Earth Echo International at www.earthecho.org.